Have you ever wondered what it might be like to actually stand inside a Vincent van Gogh painting? screen technology, I actually go inside of Vincent's paintings while reciting his very own words and written descriptions of that particular artwork. The intriguing narrative accompanying this production tells a story one will not quickly forget. The words music and art series has been compared to going to an incredible museum filled with one particular artist's entire output, but with beautiful live vocal music being sung in complete synchronization with the artwork one is seeing, filling one's senses to an exquisite aesthetic intoxication. Upcoming in the Words Music and Art series is the Fall 2002 production of Norman Rockwell in Words Music and Art, accompanied by vocal works of American composers Samuel Barber and the spring 2003 production of Great Canadian Artists in Words, Music and Art, featuring more works by Canadian artists such as Norval Morisot and Ken Danby, while accompanied by vocal music of great contemporary Canadian composers. The productions in the Words, Music and Art series are overwhelming Canadian audiences, are being rebooked all over Toronto and Canada, and are a must-see. Hello, and welcome to the Toronto, Canada-based online performance studio. The online performance studio is a state-of-the-art digital audio and visual production facility serving a growing international audience through its connection to the internet, as well as a local Canadian one. Officially launched in the fall of 2001, the online performance studio is the result of years of planning and development by myself, Linda McGuire, a Toronto-based musician and classical vocalist. Perhaps the most popular of the online performance studio releases are the exciting live vocal, live performance productions in the Words, Music and Art series. In the 65-minute live song presentation of Emily Carr in Words, Music and Art, I host on film and present the bulk of this great Canadian painter's output. After having categorized Emily's artwork into various themes, high-resolution images imported from the internet are then tastefully edited together and accompanied by carefully chosen favorite classical songs and arias. music and art has 12 musical segments in all, which are then strung together by beautifully filmed and informative narratives. This online performance studio production outlines Emily Carr's life, struggles and triumphs as a great Canadian painter. One can sit back and enjoy viewing over 150 of her truly world-class artworks all to the beautiful, live-sung vocal music of composers such as Bach, Schubert, Mozart, Puccini, and Haydn. There have been numerous future rebookings of this particular live concert multimedia production, as well as great interest in the accompanying 80-minute Words, Music and Arts presentation on Vincent Van Gogh. Following the Words, Music and Art production model, filmed visuals and high-resolution images featuring the bulk of Vincent van Gogh's incredible artistic output streamed by in this live vocal multimedia film. Oh,
aspect of the online performance studio is the live stream concert series, an ongoing online concert series featuring free bi-monthly Canadian content performances using Canadian performers. Concerts which are easily available for an international audience 24 hours a day through the internet. Streaming on Windows Media Player and on QuickTime Media Player, these free concerts feature local Canadian content classical music performances. Concerts which would have otherwise slipped into obscurity, but are now available for a worldwide audience to see, hear, and enjoy through the live stream concert series. The live stream concert series is now showcasing its third online concert, featuring Toronto's newest string quartet, the Talisker Players, in wonderful new jazz arrangements by Canadian composer John McLeod. This concert also features sizzling jazz clarinet playing of Toronto's Bob DeAngelis, along with vocalists, baritone Greg Dahl, and myself, Linda McGuire. The online performance studio has received emails and accolades from all over the world for this particular endeavor. It can be heard today at www.lindamaguire.com forward slash video. All concerts in the live stream concert series are publicized via email and are being enjoyed by online audiences all over the world. It is a very simple now to tune into and enjoy quality local Canadian content performances and the entire world is now watching with us. Future concerts in this series include projects that involve works by Canadian composers such as Andrew Adger, Cyril Irving Glick, Timothy Sullivan, Harry Friedman, and many others. The ultimate goal of this particular online performance studio endeavor is to tie in with various existing local concert series and then relay these performances to the entire world through the internet. The fourth and 
last, but certainly not the least, production endeavor of the online performance studio includes the use of quality 12 to 1 scale miniature sets in full operas and opera scenes, as well as in various music videos. For example, I used dollhouse miniature sets in each of the Vincent van Gogh narratives to the astonishment of audiences, and I am well into the design and completion of other miniature theatrical sets, which are to be incorporated into numerous upcoming operatic and musical theater productions. As a seasoned collector of miniatures and fine dollhouse collectibles, I have long been developing the judgment, technical skill, and finesse necessary to produce exhilarating new productions which combine easily accessible blue screen technology, layering, and film compositing techniques with beautiful period sets, making this innovative part of the online performance studio work a fast reality and overwhelming success. The use of miniatures and low-cost blue screen technology is unbelievably cost-effective compared with traditional operatic staging costs. Future live sung productions using blue screen and real-time virtual scenery on stage are just around the corner and readily apparent through other online performance studio productions such as the Blue Screen Cantata series. Hello, and welcome to the online performance studio's presentation of Oneness, Emily Carr in Words, Music, and Art. The words simplicity and directness are an apt description of both Emily Carr's exterior self and the expression of her inner beliefs. Her artistry also embodies noble, even heroic, personal values, and those same values which she so admired in others honesty, sincerity, and strength. It had been a difficult struggle for a woman born in 1871 in the imperialized provincial capital of Victoria, British Columbia, in Canada. The role of most women at that time was limited to either rearing children or to teaching them. Women did not even have the right to vote until 1917, when Carr herself was middle-aged. Victoria stood like a gawky girl waiting to be a grown-up city, Emily writes. The city was also home to large numbers of First Nations people and Chinese laborers. Emily had once described herself as a little old lady on the edge of nowhere. A rather truthful summing up of the geographical, artistic, and emotional isolation in which she had developed as an artist. While Victoria itself was removed from the more vibrant mainland city of Vancouver by a six-hour ferry ride, the entire province was separated from the rest of Canada by the Great Barrier of the Rocky Mountains. Of her own birth, Emily wrote, My dear little mother wrestled bravely, and I was born, and the storm has never quite lulled in my life. I've always been tossing and wrestling and buffeting it. The art of Emily Carr is a virtual portrait of the artist's lifelong search for meaning and expression from her beginnings as a traditional artist through her explorations of new styles and influences to her ultimate discovery of a highly personal manner of visual and verbal expression. My hope is that today's presentation will provide you with valuable insights into Emily Carr's inner spirit and personality embodying traits which so shaped the artistry of this extraordinary Canadian treasure. So please, sit back and enjoy the music, the song, the artworks, and the great beauty which is about to unfold before you.
Interspersed throughout our basically chronological view of Carr's life in this presentation, we will be focusing in on just a few of Emily Carr's extensive journal writings in which she speaks of the oneness of life and the synchronicity of nature, beauty, and creation. This concept of oneness is clearly reflected in her conceptualization and interpretation of God. In her published journal, Hundreds and Thousands, she comes back to this basic inspirational feature of her work time and time again, speaking of it fervently and eloquently. It was as though she were devoted to nature, which was the breath of life itself, a nature whose name was God. The only thing worth striving for is to express God. Every living thing is God made manifest. All real art is the eternal seeking to express God, the one substance out of which all things are made. Emily Carr. Notwithstanding her commercial exploits in the pottery business, it was her meeting with the Toronto-based Group of Seven that would transform her life as an artist. In her journals, Carr writes with breathless excitement about her visits to the studios of the artists who were revolutionizing Canadian art and about the range of expressions she saw in their work. A.Y. Jackson's paintings offered a rhythm and poetry that she felt her painting lacked, and in Arthur Lismer's work, she admired the sweep and rhythm of the lines, stronger colors, and simpler forms. But the artist who impressed her the most was Lauren Harris, whose work caused her to exclaim, Oh God, what have I seen? Where have I been? Something has spoken to the very soul of me, wonderful, mighty, not of this world. 
Within the Group of Seven's bold, colorful style and its passion for the Canadian landscape, she found an echo of her own efforts to express the spirit of the West Coast landscape and culture. Encouraged by the artist's acceptance of her work, and especially by Harris's words, you are one of us. Carr returned to Victoria, resolved to look for things I did not know of before, and to feel and strive and earnestly try to be true and sincere to the country and myself. Emily Carr had become a practical person who never let ordinary conventions stand in her way. 
To create more floor space in her studio, she hoisted the unneeded chairs to the ceiling using ropes and pulleys. When setting out to collect clay for her pottery, she often used a baby carriage because it was easy to push with a heavy load. When it came to art, the same instinct for finding original solutions prevailed. In 1933, Tired of the expense and inconvenience of renting small cottages from which to sketch during the summer months, Carr purchased a caravan or trailer. Fitting up the interior for sleeping, cooking, and working, she arranged to have it towed over the next four summers to a variety of sites not far from Victoria. Its arrival in her life is recorded in her journals. Dreams do come true sometimes. Caravans ran around inside of my head from the time I was no high. Then one day, plop, dropped the caravan. There it sat, gray and lumbering, like an elephant. The summer sketching trips with the elephant, which she shared with her monkey, rat, and four dogs, were among Emily's happiest. Her sense of freedom, joy, and delight in her search for harmony with nature is readily reflected in many of the oil-on-paper paintings done over those years. In abstract tree forms, for example, trees and branches have been transformed into sweeping ribbons of color dancing across the surface. It is a swinging rhythm of thought swaying back and forth, filling space, leaving space, shouting but silent, she writes. She also reminds us, do not forget, artist. A picture is not a collection of portrayed objects, nor is it, is it a certain effect of light and shade, nor is it a show of color, nor a magnificence of form, nor yet is it anything seeable or sayable. It is a glimpse of God interpreted by the soul. It is life to some degree expressed.
I was interrupted these days by my toiling on a new picture representing the outside of a night cafe. On the terrace, there are tiny figures of people drinking. An enormous yellow lantern sheds its light on the terrace, the house front, and the sidewalk, and even casts a certain brightness on the pavement of the streets, which takes a pinkish violet tone. The gable-topped fronts of the houses in the street, stretching away under a blue sky spangled with stars, are dark blue or violet, and there is a green tree. Here you have a night picture without any black in it, done with nothing but beautiful blue and violet and green and citron yellow color. It amuses me enormously to paint the night right on the spot. They used to draw and paint pictures in the daytime after the rough sketch, but I find satisfaction in painting things immediately. Of course, it's true that in the dark, I may mistake a blue for a green, a blue lilac for a pink lilac, for you cannot rightly distinguish the quality of a hue. But it is the only way to get rid of the conventional night scenes with their poor, shallow, whitish light, whereas a simple candle already gives us the richest yellows and orange tints. My house here is painted the yellow color of fresh butter on the outside with glaringly green shutters. It stands in the full sunlight in a square which has a green garden with plane trees, oleanders, and acacias. And it is completely whitewashed inside, and the floor is made of red bricks. And over it there is the intensely blue sky in this, I can live and breathe, meditate and paint. Here, I feel much better than I did in Paris. Oh. 
Oh, oh. 